discuss um, a theme could be considered propaganda, right? Um, so I I, um, I played a propaganda game. Um, there was a website that I'll see if I can find again to see if it's still running. Um, and I played a game where you are um, you are in a a bulldozer, and you have Palestinian pigs who are running at you, and you drive over them in your bulldozer. Right? So it was trying to explain the Palestinian uh, pig scum and should be killed. Okay? So, you know, not a great game. Um, the, but what you could even extend it to something like uh, Papers, Please, as a, as a game. Papers, Please? Uh, have you paid papers, please? So, yeah, if you go papers, please. Um, okay. Some of them are and there, so there are academic papers on these as well as as the games. Some of those games are still available, so there are publications on this stuff. Yeah, uh, just to clarify, okay. we're supposed to pick one paper each, one paper. Okay, so there are three, so, so that session, because there are three of you, and kind of the way that we've got, we've got 19, so I've got to have one either by themselves, or I added it to you, so you've got three. Um, in the session, yes, there are three in the session. Yeah. 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 yeah, so you guys have three. So this is going to be a, a, round, a bit more of a round table discussion because you guys are all in some propaganda games, apparently. Um, <laughs> Okay, so will you all agree that the po uh, that, that propaganda should be done in the afternoon? Yes. Okay. It's more effective this way. Right. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And, and <laughs> okay. So if we move propaganda to the the, the evening, <laughs> um, so of the of the the sixteenth, okay, we could all the afternoon. Um, yeah. When is when is it? But then, uh, uh, that, well, no, that, it's not yet in the time frame. Yeah, it's not yet in the time frame. I can I'm because uh, I'm I'm adding it in to fit it in. Um, and so it w w we would have normally had it at this time, being a Tuesday, um, the sixteenth. It would be at ten, right? But if we move, but you've got class all day for that. Yeah. Yeah. right? So we could try. How are, how are people with having a class after three o'clock? Five. Yeah. Would we be willing to do propaganda games at Student Houston? Yeah. Right. Yes. Thursday. It, it will be no. That will be uh, we'll the Tuesday. Tuesday, the sixteenth mm. of February. So in about a month, about, about three weeks. Four weeks. Four weeks. Sixteenth of February. Yeah. Do we have class then? Um, it's one I'm wanting to add. Okay. Yeah. Propaganda games. So um, we oh, could do. Oh, you want to do? We're the, yeah, the we're the eighteenth to the, 18th to the 16th, so we can actually have it because we need the day because the ski day uses burns a lecture otherwise. So um, if if we try and and I'll try and talk to the student who sit guys and try and get student who sit. Otherwise, we can can try and do it in a more comfortable environment in the evening. But I need to find a an in the evening environment. Um, I'm. If I was being really cheeky, I could invite you all to my house, and we all could go to my house and have the lecture in our lounge, because I probably can sit about this many people around the table. And Rachel have it. does not approve. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not the only one who gets to make these kind of decisions. And I know she does not approve. <laughs> Um, yeah, I live 800 meters down the hill, yeah. right? So I, I, I live almost closer than Worcester. Um, so, um, but we, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to Student Hooset and see if we can, we can get Student Hooset and do it in the evening because it would be nice to have, have, have it be able to be done something there. So, so I will try and do it later in the day and do it as a kind of different one with the, um, with propaganda because. Propaganda is a, is an interesting topic, right? It really does is is 
challenging in all the ways you can think about it, right? So, uh, and we might have some heated discussion about propaganda, hopefully. So. Okay, but you guys would be, if, if I can organize an, an, a, a kind of, um, what would be the best evening time for you guys? Is it sort of seven to nine or six to eight or, because when do you guys eat food? <laughs> I'm not we're, offering we're the time. Right. <laughs> if, if you guys want to bring pizza to it and eat during it, then I'm not going to pay for pizza. Sorry. <laughs> right. But I'm certainly happy for people to, 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 to eat pizza. Um, if we wanted to have it. You can pay our pizza and we pay your beer because you're not allowed to buy us beer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm also not allowed to drink. <laughs> I have a solution for that. Right. I get hammered before the session? No, no, no. <laughs> you're not allowed to drink, but if you distill the gelatin with the alcohol, you can eat it. Ah, <laughs> I wasn't drinking alcohol, I was eating vodka jelly. <laughs> yes, or, or watermelons I hear are quite good for this, right? Yeah. As, as you do, you get the watermelon bottle yeah. of vodka upside down, it and infuses it. into the watermelon. Now you can, apparently you can get a whole bottle of vodka into a watermelon. Um, and then eat there. And then you eat the water. You eat and the you're never watermelon. drunk. <laughs> I didn't drink anything. I just ate stuff. <laughs> it was poisoned with alcohol, but you know, damn biscuits. No, um, right. Okay. So opponents, we now have things. Right. You can come. Yeah, do you want to come and sit after the presentation as the opponent? Okay. Okay, well, you, yep, okay, well, we, we, we can have you a, a, a pose from the back. Okay, right, so um, you're ready to present the paper. We really need to get a tripod. We need to get a good <laughs> swivel tripod y thing. Actually, we need multiple cameras and be able to switch between them and do like proper media production and exactly. have a crew and have staff for this. And yeah, that'd be lovely. Um, okay, so present the. Yeah, I will be presenting the paper with the title The Challenge of Designing. Scientific discovery games with a lot of authors. non-expert gamers, so their potential to solve uh, complex problems in the field of science. And um, yeah, they go very well into the details of the challenges they, that they have faced uh, while uh, making this, uh, this scientific discovery game. That, that also, the game which actually helped experts solve co complex problems in the field of bio, uh, biochemistry. Uh, so what they did in the folded, folded game, they uh, took an approach, an uh, iterative approach. So they had the concept, they had the idea, and then what they did, they consulted with experts, which they uh, stress out a lot of times that this iterative approach that they had is consulted with the experts and then because this is a game that actually the results of the puzzle so the game is about let me talk about the game the game is about um, predicting protein structures uh, complex protein structures so what they do they they, they um, convert the um, protein structure into a puzzle the problem is actually a puzzle and then they put it out on the game so that the players can uh, can solve it and but this this puzzles are first um, so the science the, the scientists of the biochemistry they form the problem that they have and then the game automatically con it converts it into a puzzle and but it put, puts it out uh, for people to play it and um, so so the interactive approach again. Um, because the game itself, the, the, the neither the scientists, neither the, the developers do not know the outcome of the, they don't know the solution. So what they do is just, the game will um, um, 
take them to the solution as, 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 they, uh, as they progress. So that was actually one of the biggest challenges they had because they didn't know the solution. So, and so that's why it, the iterative approach came to help. So they made the prototypes, put it out, the, player, the players played the game, and then they got feedback from the players. What is currently going well? Where are the complex parts of the game? Where are the players having difficulties? And then they made improvement based on that, but all the time consulting with the experts. If this is uh, tolerable for uh, the problem to be still scientific. Um, the game <coughs> follows the traditional game aspects, such as uh, <coughs> it has intro levels for the newcomers, so that they can, that they can uh, learn the game, because they do not ex expect the players to have any knowledge on biochemistry. Uh, that, that, that's, that's why they have intro levels. Then you have the typical client-server approach, <coughs> which, um, which enables collaboration between players. So the ar architecture of the game is just uh, there's a, uh, uh, the players download the client, and the server just automatically publishes the, the games, the puzzles, and then the players can, can solve it. And every time there is an update, as I said, because there was this interactive approach where all the time there was changes in the game, it was automatically done on the, on the client. And also, it, has to, it had to be fun, when one of the traditional game aspects. Uh, but yeah, as they say, the unique challenge was enabling non-expert natural problem solvers to advance a specific scientific domain, right? And um, they also talk about how the challenges of uh, of uh, visualization of the scientific game, uh, where they have to promote complex solutions to the problem solver while still maintaining a access accessible complexity for the beginners, right? So it had it had to be easy for the beginners, but at the same time, for those players who could actually solve way more complex solutions, it had, it was, um, it provided that for them too. So that was basically the, the visualization part. In the, the interaction, you talk about uh, optimizing the human exploration process while respecting the scientific constraints. This means that uh, they had to, they had to involve, they had to have a, made a space for the players to be explorable. So, so the players could explore what's going on in this, in this part of the of the protein, with the, like, what what the um, chemical reactions are happening, what the other players are doing. So that was the, the part of the exploration of the game. But they still had to maintain and respect the scientific constraints for the game to be scientific, uh, this scientific discovery. They also talk about the scoring mechanisms. They had a very unique uh, scoring mechanism. Uh, well, they, pro they had to promote multiple human strategies while remaining true to the models of scientific phenomena. So as, as you have probably uh, read it, the only motivational aspect of this game is to overcome the other player. Right, because they don't know if, because there's this um, this term of uh, the native structure for a uh, for a protein. If the if the structure that they have built is um, near to the native structure, that means that it is free of uh, uh, it is low in free energy, which means it's a good solution. But they did not show that. They just gave points to the players based on other other aspects. So the player did actually did not know if it, if he's uh, uh, if he's uh, approach and solving the problem was the best than the others. They just had points, right? So your goal as a player was not to uh, achieve a, a certain state in the game. It was just to overcome the other players. So that was the only that was one of the motivation. <laughs> And yeah, as I said earlier, usually in scientific games, the solution is unknown, which in, in COVID was, uh, that was true. Um, yeah, we talked about this. Uh, so players were meant to find the native structure of the protein structures posted by the scientists. The original goal of the game itself was to find the best possible protein structure, which was unknown for the scientists. 
They wanted to solve the problem from the gamers. That was the goal of the game, where the, the goal of the, the scientific goal, but the game goal was to just perform better than the other players and get as, as higher scores as possible. Uh, they recorded uh, 57,000 players that played the game, and they made it possible for anyone to discover and participate in biochemistry, <coughs> which is, um, again, a very good motivational aspect, telling, telling the players that you are actually contributing on uh, solving scientific problems, which there was um, in one of the articles that Simon um, uh, recommended us to read. It said that they actually um, solved a problem that the scientists, scientists were struggling for almost one decade uh, in Poland. Mm -hmm. oh. uh, yeah. <clears throat> so the interactive strategy on improving the game and pro progressing towards better results was, was um, the unique approach that they took. The visualization, so reflect and illuminate the natural rules of the system. How they did this. Uh, so in, for, for them enable to reflect and illuminate the natural rules of the system, they enabled some constraints on the, on the game. What they did, um, they had uh, four, uh, four rules. The first rule was to avoid clashes in the game. Then it was to... Um, um, fill the void inside the, the protein structure. Afterwards, it was the, the third rule to, was to bury exposed hydrophobics and hydrogen bonds. So this this enabled this enabled uh, to still maintain the the scientific uh, and the rules of the system. And they met. Uh, on the other hand, they had to manage and hide the complexity of the system. So for uh, beginners. For users that were not uh, able to solve complex complex uh, problems, the system was able to hide complexity from the users, and it must be approachable by players who have no lo no knowledge no knowledge uh, from the scientific problem. And the interactions again, uh, they had to respect the constraints of the system. It had to be su su uh, sufficient to explore. They converted from. Uh, from the, in the beginning, it was just with sliders, and uh, but then afterwards they made a 3D version of the game, so it, it was more more uh, interactive and approachable for the players, and intuitive and fun uh, because they made they made um, animations and a really good looking interface for the protein center. Yeah, a very interesting part about the scoring. Um, so they want to motivate the players to find the best possible protein structure, yet they don't know what that is, right? So to do that, uh, they organized uh, the game was organized in the form of a competition, right? So just um, as I as I explained later, the only the only uh, thing that they knew was just the points. They didn't know if they were near the solution or not. They just had to overcome the other player in order to to be the best, and and that was the, the that was the benefit for the scientists to find the best solution for the protein structure, and uh, yeah, introduction level. They provide a lot of uh, introductory levels for the newcomers, so it starts easy in the beginning, but they also teach the concepts of how to make make protein structures uh, the best way possible, but. Uh, the introductory levels was kind of different uh, if you compare it with the puzzles. So what they did is they they provided uh, online beginner puzzles where they posted for one month, so pe so people could just go and try to solve the, on the beginner puzzle before they went, before they could try to solve the the real puzzle, which uh, which if you just completed the introductory levels and then went to the puzzles. Would be very overwhelming and complex, and would draw out players not to play the game anymore. So, in the end, for them to to prove that this was a good design and everything, they had uh, um, they made an evaluation. 
So they competed in a um, cast bait competition in 2008, which is uh, a competition for protein structure prediction. Uh, so what they did is they participated mainly in homology modeling sequences, and they they took um, they took um, protein structures from the previous competition from CAS7, which was in 2007, and because they knew the proteins, the native protein structures from that competition, they made it into puzzles and then put it put it out for the players to play, and um, they found out that. When they when they tr when they were trying to solve the puzz the puzzles from the Casp seven competition, they actually went far way further away from the native structure than it was in the beginning. So what they did, they added some expert constraints on uh, how far away they could go, they could how further they could go from the native structure, and that turned out to be a very good indicator which gave uh, way better results after after having the constraints applied. And this also, uh, so the results from the table here shows that the, um, the players actually managed to have to have really good results on, because here you can see there were 71 protein structures, I think, and then the third, the third place, 7 and 21, were won by the folded players, whereas here, there were other other uh, um, participants who did not use folded. They just used normal pr procedures on uh, protein structure prediction. So as you can see, uh, they say that uh, the game, <coughs> based on these results, they say that the game can be.
into the game. So it has to be complex, but accessible and easy at the same time. Yes, but is it uh, unique for these types of games? Yeah, let's say that. Um, So I mean, the, 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 the question is partly in if if in a game you in a normal game you don't care about people understanding what's going on, right? So they can go more and more abstract. And it doesn't matter because all you're doing is playing game. Um, whereas for the science you can go every game. If you believe that it's important that the person solving the problem understands the problem they're solving or the importance of it. Then having that true representation is important. Now, the criticism could be, well, you know, I don't actually need to know what problem I'm solving. If it's just a, a bunch of, of mathematical, if it's just a, a bunch of mathematical equations and I'm reducing them to find out the form, I don't really actually need to know that this is a tank firing over a hill. I could just be a whole bunch of numbers do the formulas and come out with an answer. And I don't need to know the mapping from the real world to the representation. So so you could so you could argue that the reason they find it was important is part of the motivation for people to keep doing it yeah. was that it's science. Right? And if it's not science, then people might go, well, you know, no reason to play this game versus the yeah. other game because it's they're all just abstract representations. So that's where I, that's where I defend the, the comment. Though it's probably not quite aligned, they should say, because we are trying to use scientific discovery as a motivator, it's very important to have this mapping understandable to the user. No, I think those are orthogonal issues, because if they mapped the problem into solving Sudoku, and I'm now mm -hmm. solving Sudoku, which solves the protein folding problem, yep. you know, what it's... If Sudoku is fun enough to yeah, play, then people exactly. can play Sudoku. Um, yeah, and I'm I'm good at it, supposedly, and then I can solve the you know probably folding problem by just playing Sudoku, right? Question is, would you play Sudoku? Uh, like how? Yeah. So when you're talking about motivation, how much do you need to bring in? Right. So, so like um, the fact that um, games for health, for example, the reason you might play is because you personally want to get healthier, right? The game for education, I want to learn something. Right, so I bring motivation with me to play this game that might be a bit suboptimal. Right, for games for science, I might play this game even though it's not like the best game in the world, but it's good enough. Right, but I know a, I'm helping. Right, it's a bit like why people eat the low-fat version of food. Right, um, I don't know about you, but generally I find the low-fat version of food slightly less tasty than the full-fat version. Would most of you mostly agree with that? Yes. Right? How many of you have eaten low-fat food? Sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> um, and there are a lot of people who eat the low-fat version of food because, you know, it's good enough, right? You know, it's, it's satisfying enough, but they want to lose weight. So they have another motivation to eat it other than, given the straight choice, this is the tastiest of the options I have, right? And I think serious games can fit in that same category. In these games of science, if you bring in that motivation of saying, hey, well, I'm doing this for science. Yes. This is fun enough for me. <laughs> it, is, it may not be the very best <laughs> of my optional games, but the science link makes it's it. A, yeah, it's a bit fun, but the fact that you're contributing to science discovery, it's <coughs> motivating. That's the additional bit that they can utilize to motivate you to keep playing the game. Right? So it's it's kind of that finding finding that balance. Right? And I think that's that's what a lot of games of science, well, well, serious games need to do is they need to find that balance. They don't necessarily have to be the most fun game you could possibly do. They have to be good enough that you know there are some low-fat versions of food I will not eat, right? Because they taste so disgusting that I don't care if it's good for me. I'm not going to eat it. Right? So you yeah. can't make your serious game terrible. <coughs> There's uh, some recent uh, suggestions that you actually should eat the full fat versions of food <laughs> and, and yeah. uh, the carbs instead and sugars because the fat itself is actually quite good <laughs> yeah. and it's a better source of energy anyway. So yeah, you know, yeah, and there's a whole bunch of stuff on on your body recognizes 
fat when it when it senses fat it goes oh I've been eating so I don't need to keep eating yeah. <laughs> whereas if it you satisfies you faster, quicker yeah, yeah. so this, it complicates it <laughs> But, but I think for this kind of uh, games and the games, I think it's also the uh, challenge of the game itself. Maybe enough to do it by a lot of players. And That's right. Crosswords, as a focus, they're still around and people play them. Not for prices, but just as an uh, entertaining activity that entices and challenges you, and, and you feel good at it. So, you would like to continue challenges out and mm. make harder and harder problems. So I think this kind of, uh, if there's a hit, with, this is the kind of puzzles you like, then it might be motivating just to puzzle without being too worried about what's going to be used and be too worried about the scoring schemes. It's just that it's a challenge and fine tuning and finding nice solutions is motivating itself to some nerdy people. Yeah. Well, <laughs> okay, so this is a question to the audience. Um, so when you were at school, there's a discussion on, on um, games for education. If you tell kids that food is good for them, sometimes the kids won't eat it because, you know, you've told them it's good for them and they go, well, it would be awful then. Right, so there's there's this this concept of if if you tell people that this is for science, there will some people say, oh, you're making me work, aren't you? You're making me do homework. <laughs> um, and whereas if you make it just for fun, like if you can turn cleaning your room from do it because you have to to look, we'll put the basket over here and you can throw the toys into the basket and it becomes a game of how many you can get in the basket, right? <laughs> If they think, oh, well, you're just tricking me into doing my, my chores, um, <laughs> at some point they refuse because they've identified the trick. Do, do you run the risk in, in Folnet of playing too heavy a science card so that you drive away people who are put off by science? So, person defend, do you think there's a valid possibility, person who is... is Negative towards it. Um, Do you think you can drive off people by saying sciencey, 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 science? And so for the pro, well, we have a comment over there. <laughs> yep. I think that uh, for some people, uh, science, science, science can be. Um, they can be afraid of it, and that will be the reason why they will think, oh no, I will not handle it. And yeah, that's maybe the reason why will, they will not play it. Because this is, okay. a game. this is a game, so it's a challenge. You take challenges, you play games, you take challenge. And I was, I wanted to make a comment about after Duna's comment, when he said that this is, um, yeah, it's a puzzle. You challenging and you just keep going on to the, solve the problem. And another thing about the game is that it never stops. There's always something to be More solved. Challenging. <laughs> yeah, there's always something to be solved, which is a very good aspect of the game for being motivated and not <clears throat> not making the player stop. Because, okay, I just did the final level, I defeated the boss, that's it, I don't play the game anymore. But here it's just you, you get problems for the, from the scientists that need need solutions mm. and you just participate and contribute in the science. That's the biggest the problem with the uh, photo language system. It doesn't get more challenging after you've done the case. <laughs> no, no, it doesn't really ramp up in difficulty because and, and when it did, when it like when you had a when with lots of already tag things, That's it just became of, silly yeah, difficulty. It was kind of I now I have to find irrelevant things. So it didn't become more difficult yeah. but relevant. It just became crazy. So, yep. And with labeling the photo games as a science game. Uh, you motivate the players to yeah, could, uh, aim for the best solution and not for only one solution. So for, for some people, knowing that they're trying to help science discover these yeah. things and keeps, mo keeps them going to find even better and better and better solutions rather than just, oh, I got high score, I can stop now. Um, um, so, so opening it up to more one, one more comment. So there, there was a study done on boredom, and they made people do some boring tasks, and they tried to motivate them using various methods to actually continue doing the boring task, and they used them a method of saying, yeah, you're actually helping children or you're saving cancer treatment or whatever, and it had no effect. 
So if you're given a boring game, people will not play it no matter what, you know, uh, strong reasons you may tell them, you know, playing that game would help. So I, I kind of agree with Rune that the, the game mechanics and the challenge in the game is kind of fundamental and the out, outer layers are sort of good to have sometimes, but they may not impact the, you know, the actual people participating in the activity. So can I ask, how many people actually downloaded and played for How far did you get? Uh, you just did the training rooms? Yeah, yeah same. Yeah. Yeah, just a minute. Um, so, um, oh, yeah, so I, I play, I play for a bit, and and there is a bit of a chatty community on the site. You can actually chat with people. Yeah. There is a social aspect That's to it, and I think if you're very geeky, the social might also keep you there because mm -hmm. there are a whole bunch of other people who are interested in the same kind of geeky, sciencey kind of activities. And like you know, people who go to bridge club, right? Um, and they play bridge, and they're like, so as one of the uh, game researchers in Norway. She is a professional level bridge player, right? So she, so she was in the presentation watching the bridge like competition on her on her phone because <laughs> like the world champs were going on at the time. So she was watching the hands being played. And so you know, uh, she has a whole community around bridge play, right? Which isn't just about am I the absolute best at playing bridge? It's also that social aspect. So in here they have those forums and they have those social aspects. And for me, because scientists sometimes find it, well, and you have to basically come to universities to find a group of people who are interested in science, right? And if you are separated from that, you went to university, you're now in a real job where you're being paid to do something for you. Um, getting that feeling back of, I'm interested in science, but I'm disconnected from it. I think some of the reasons success for some of these games, and, and iWire is another one that you, if you haven't played, I, have any of you played iWire before? Okay, if you're interested in, in, in another game for science built by the same people who did Fold It, or some of the same people who did Fold It, build a, a, an, a game called iWire, E-Y-E-W-I-R-E. -E. I, I like the other one more, actually. You like iWire yeah. more. iWire is a uh, flood filling game, right? So you're, you're, you've got slices of, of um, neural tissue. And you've got to find individual neurons out of that because, of course, they all overlap and they march together. And so your job is to kind of map out the neural structure of the retina. Right? So it's a another game, again, a community game, um, and uh, they're also they're, they're still doing more research on it. Um, and it's again a community of people interested in the science, and that's what can draw people in beyond just the game itself. Um, so for me, there is a a kind of threshold below which, if the game is worse than this, you won't play it. Right? So terrible games, you just won't play terrible games, no matter how good the motivation. And then there's this range where your extrinsic motive, like your your personal intrinsic motivation to support this activity is enough to make the game playable. And then you kind of go above that where it becomes independently playable and people just play it because it's awesome. Right? Uh, completely independently of any justification for it. Uh, I think iWire and Folded generally fit in the middle of those two. Um, I can't think of any particular game for science that fits into the all people play this because it's so much better than any other game they could choose to play. Can any of you think of a, of a science game? Portal is probably the closest, but we'll be discussing Portal. Next. But it's not science. But it's not science. It kind of teaches something about physics. Sort of. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, it's puzzle solving with physics and kind of things. So, but it's not for scientific discovery. We fold it and I wire are very much scientific discovery. And and tagging, if you consider tagging part of science, um, and and understanding images as part of science, then I think I am the. That's why I picked um, ESP is also a game. Right, so uh, we've got 10 minutes left of questions yeah, and reviews. Yep. Just a uh, concluding remark, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, what can be learned, I mean, totally conclusion, what can be learned from this study when these are uh, designed serious games? I mean, if you look here, they are learning the importance of including iterative adjustments. Yeah. Uh, initial decisions can always be improved. Yeah. Uh, 
and learn not to expect the way that the expert scientists view the problem to be the best way for us. And this, the learning outcome, there isn't much here that really would help us in designing a good game, I feel. Is that right, or? Yeah, I, I think that they have, in my opinion, they have kind of a problem with the approach of gener generalizability. Because they mentioned that the challenge of designing scientific discovery games is the title, title and they only talk about folding. So uh, <laughs> it's kind of they talk about how they did it in folding. <laughs> yeah, but if you want to tell like the challenge of designing scientific <coughs> discovery games at all, you have in to general, take like, at yeah. least two, three examples yeah. of games. So I was reading the abstract first, and then the conclusion. And after the conclusion, I wasn't. Uh, yeah, I. Skim through the rest. You were this point interesting at all. <laughs> you were you were convinced that this <laughs> was going to actually teach you what the title said it was going to teach you. Um, and you know that's a, a, again the, the lessons learned is something that we also have to try and work out now. What can what could we extract as a group? I mean, so there, there are questions from the audience. Um, so do you have any? Um, so we'll think about what can we extract from this. And your questions are part of that. So do you do you have any other questions from the audience that we have for this week? Because and, and we've now got the go around system set up for Thursday, so hopefully you guys can. You can post your questions there. Yeah. And papers already in there. The papers yeah. are already in there. You can post your start posting your questions for the next, for, for the Thursday session there. So you know, uh, uh, Mario and I we are having this discussion where every so often we should have objective measures or more subjective measures, and I think with fifty-seven thousand folded players and more in depth analysis, uh, qualitative study on motivation, engagement, on how they work, might be as useful as just to say how design this whole thing. Yeah, I, and, and um, one of the things, I, I, a criticism that I have of, of, do you have more criticisms that you can think of? Okay, a big criticism that I have is that, uh, and this is one of the ones that, that I have actually seen them criticized for, was given that they are searching through a constrained space, right? Because we have constraints, the standard way of doing this is you code all the constraints, which they've had to do anyway, and then you just run it, it over supercomputers, right? You just take supercomputers and you just make them search the space instead of having a human manually manipulate thing with a mouse. You just get a computer to try every single possibility, right? So the brute force search, brute force supercomputer search versus human somehow pattern matching visually guided, <coughs> right? Now, from an energy usage point of view, how much electrical power was used to keep the computers that those players were using on? And those people warm in the room they were in, versus the power used to brute force it from the from a, a data center, and brute forcing it from a data center generates more answers per kilowatt of power than allowing the players to play the game. Do can you still justify making people or having people play the game, even though it's less carbon efficient or energy efficient? than brute forcing with supercomputers. Considering that people have fun and learn something from the game, I think yes. <laughs> it has proved that that the um, folded players actually overperformed the Rosetta algorithm that just brute forces all and makes search and tries to find a solution. Mm -hmm. So I think I think it's yes. and I think the uh, person who play the game will run their computer uh, still, if they don't play this game, they will do something else on the computer. So it's additional cost if you run a supercomputer. Right. So, so yeah. So, you, you, so when when you have these these is it valuable arguments, you have to kind of come up with those kind of defenses, which is they were running a computer anyway. Yeah. Um, they're having to be alive anyway. They're having fun. They're learning mm -hmm. things. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I think you can you you come with those sort of defenses against this, right? But there is, uh, at some point, where is the crossover point? We also probably raise that expectation, the question of euros. So, I mean, it's just too expensive to rent these people. That's why they use people around them. 
Yeah, yeah, no, they they don't have the money to pay for the supercomputer time. The first choice. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we we we'll just get people to do it because you know if they want to contribute, then that's fine. Uh, and it's one of those those things of of um, uh, that that's an active discussion around Bitcoin, right? And and mining Bitcoin. Um, the cost to mine a coin is determined basically by the electricity cost of running the service. Right? So that's so um, at some point it becomes unprofitable to mine for Bitcoin because the cost of the electricity is too high. Right? Now, if you're using a data center in Norway that's being called by sort of Arctic fjords, right? And so you don't have massive calling bills on your, your servers. Um, you can bring the cost of running supercomputers down to quite low. And as we get better supercomputers, the cost of brute forcing on a supercomputer does cross over. At what point would you, as a group, justify saying, well, okay, we shouldn't be making these kind of games. If we're just searching a space, we have computers to do that. What do you thought? <laughs> Does anyone else? Any, I, well, I mean, supercomputers can solve Sudokus and crosswords as well. So, what's the problem? <laughs> <laughs> so, we should just stop doing Sudokus and crosswords because, you know, <laughs> the computer can solve them. Why the hell are you guys wasting your time? As long as it's identity and challenging to the users, why should we stop it? Right. Because I suppose you could look at, at all sports activities. I mean, the, the golf ball doesn't necessarily need to be moved around the course. It doesn't benefit from it. Um, and certainly when you climb to the top of a mountain, you probably come back down again and end up where you were. <laughs> the mountain's still there. <laughs> the mountain's still there. And you probably don't take things and leave them at the top as your job. <laughs> so yeah, so um, so yeah, I think I think we for all of the serious gaming, it's one of the things we do need to think about is is what is the main objective, right, of our of our intervention? Is it to provide kind of a, a enjoyment for people and to have them involved and have them care about science? Um, I I know one of the arguments, and I saw this around recycling, was that initial recycling efforts are generally carbon negative, as in it costs more to recycle than if you just made stuff. <coughs> but people feel good about it and it raises their awareness and they start to think about other things they do. And so it's the first step towards the right attitude toward the environment rather than just looking at that thing in isolation. So science games and games where people think, hey, I can actually do something positive here might be that first step towards thinking more critically and thinking more how can I contribute. Even if on an individual instance you look at folders and say, well, actually, it would have been better if we just brute force it with a computer. But, um, so I think you can justify it even in sort of attitudinal shifts in the population. Right, okay. Any other comments from people? Can I get a quick um, straw poll on, on how did you feel about that format for discussion? Seemed fine? A bit more time to prepare, but the, you know, we get better at that as we, the, the, the course goes through. So some people are already starting thinking about it. But, but it's, it's, it's all right. It's, it's all right. Then. It's interesting. It's different. Part of the game. It's part of the game. We're playing a game. Um, and next week we're going to start scoring you guys for the questions you start asking. So so that's that, that'll be fun. Um, so uh, Thursday I'm, uh, I've sent, sent Steinrunner an email and I'll try and, and get that sorted. But we will do ours at the 10 till 12 session. Right? You guys are available 10 till 12 on Thursday, I think. Are you all available on 10 till 12? No. You're not. You're not there from 8 to 10 anyway, so okay. So so it wouldn't matter if, if, if we moved it to 10 till 12, you still can't do it. But we'll, we'll record so you can uh, get that. Okay, so you guys are happy with, with 10 till 12? So you don't have to be here at 8 a.m. in the morning on Thursday morning? Okay, good. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
Pretty hard to hear, hard. right? Okay. So yeah, maybe we both and both and yeah, make sure you can yeah maybe we, we need to be yeah yeah maybe we need to be louder. <laughs> um, so loud, loud is, is a problem for noise. So yeah, so we have to encourage people to fill the space with their voices. So the recording was too quiet. What? So you checked and it was a bit quiet. I guess he spoke too quiet. I see. He has a presentation about yeah. the paper. I see. Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, was I guess it's quite hard for the recording to follow. Yeah. It, it may well. Be. Okay. Um, so um, that's all good, and we'll see you on Thursday. So who's presenting on Thursday? Just so I. You do. You're you're good. You kind of understand what you need to do. Yeah. But um, yeah. Am I right that uh, the first one listed on the uh, list will present the first paper and the second one? Yeah. Yeah. So I tried to reverse order of your names so that I gave you you one and and Agnes the other one. Okay. Yeah. Um, I I just arbitrarily made that decision this time because I wanted I didn't want to go back and forth and discuss and, and take too much time before I said go for it. Um, and hopefully they're both interesting cases. Um, for next week, um, I'll we can enter a little bit of an email discussion back and forth so that by Thursday we can decide who actually is going to lead the debate. But um, and and I'll I'll give out papers and stuff. Are, are you taking into consideration our suggestions? Yes. Or? Yeah, that's what I want to do. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, and if you suggest one, I'm going to suggest that you would boot in the one you suggest. Yeah. Okay.